Welcome to the third clip of this week's lecture on the concept of agency and power, in which we will home in uh, on the kind of key great figure from social theory who informs these approaches deeply, which is that of Max Weber, the great German social theorist and sociologist. Um, Max Weber was a contemporary of Durkheim's, uh, but whereas Durkheim lived in France, <laughs> Weber lived in Germany. And in many ways, uh, the differences between their respective approaches can be understood in terms of the distinction that I made in an earlier clip between the kind of enlightenment trajectory uh, that came out of France, uh, and the, uh, you know, the encyclopedists, the uh, idea that through reason, human fa uh, through the kind of exercise of reason, human ha happiness would be attained and that ultimately human beings could be and their behavior could be explained on the model of natural science. And the counterpoint that the German Romanticism played to that idea, um, for example, through the um, kind of disagreement between Immanuel Kant, who himself was German, but exemplifies rather anomalous, anomalously or difficultly for this crude cultural uh, distinction that I'm making here, a kind of French uh, enlightenment approach to things and his students uh, Herder who who uh, um, is famous for for uh, theorizing this concept of culture or culture as a distinguishing mark of humanity and this German idea that human beings are qualitatively different from other uh, beings in the world other uh, species uh, by uh, virtue of the fact that they live their lives in relation to the meanings that they ascribe to them uh, and that to understand human beings is to engage uh, with meaning and its interpretation right we've seen this idea uh, crop up uh, not least in, in the American tradition of cultural anthropology that the German uh, Franz Boas uh, is a point of origin for but we, but we encounter this idea again this week in the work of Max Weber because uh, Max Weber too, and in fact Max Weber is a major inspiration for a lot of these American anthropologists that we talked about a few weeks ago, including Clifford Gitt, he too makes a, a, a great point of emphasizing uh, the significance of the fact that people's actions, if they're going to be understood, have to be understood in relation to their meaning, right? And there's this distinction, if you like, between an action and a mere event goes back to that example of the wink I gave a few weeks ago in relation to Clifford Gitt. Uh, so a wink is an action. Uh, it has, it embodies an intention. It conveys an intention, uh, possibly even a desire or a motive, uh, and can have an effect on the world. But it's not uh, uh, merely a happening or an event. It's an action because it has an author. Uh, and it can be understood in relation to the motivation that underpins it, right? That's a central idea also for Max Weber. And really it's the founding uh, premise or the kind of cornerstone of his uh, sociological uh, theory, which uh, he developed uh, in uh, very voluminous sets of writings. He was a very interesting character. Uh, he was a, a liberal by temperament and, and politically, um, he was also uh, an incredibly erudite and um, um, under a great deal of pressure uh, put himself to produce uh, a great deal of work and drove, drove himself to having a nervous breakdown early on in his career. Uh, a very interesting character, I won't go into his biography uh, any, uh, in any depth at all, uh, but just to say it's worth kind of acquainting yourself a little bit uh, with, with Max Weber as a person. It's always worth acquainting yourself with all of the people that we're talking about, also as people, which by the way is a very Weberian thing to do because the whole point of the approach that Max Weber took is that we need to think of people as individuals ultimately and understand what they do in relation to their motives. So I've got this long quote here from Economy and Society, one of Weber's um, kind of key texts, uh, which is one of the things that you're invited to read for this week. And this uh, quote really captures the whole um, approach and uh, the tensions that are inherent within it. So he says, in the case of social collectivities, 
we are in a position to go beyond merely demonstrating functional relationships and uniformities. We can accomplish something that is never attainable in the natural sciences, namely the subjective understanding of the action of the component individuals, the component individuals of the social collectivities that he referred to in the first sentence. So immediately here he's making a distinction, a qualitative distinction between the study of social collectivities, social science and natural science. And if natural science uh, limits itself to demonstrating functional relationships and uniformities, for example, the natural laws of, say, Newtonian physics or something like that, the social sciences can go beyond that to a subjective understanding of the action of people. Right? This additional achievement, he continues, of explanation by interpretive understanding, as distinguished from external observation, is, of course, attained only at a price. Uh, the more hypothetical and fragmentary character of its results. Nevertheless, subjective understanding is the specific characteristic of sociological knowledge. Now, what I want to really pick out here is the word explanation. For Max Weber, the fact that our engagement with people's actions has to be interpretive because it has to be understood in relation to the subjective understanding, the meaning, the motivation that under, underpins an ex, uh, uh, people's actions, that doesn't mean that it can't also be explained. Remember the distinction that we made in earlier lectures between explanatory approaches which align themselves with natural sciences and interpretive approaches with align themselves, which align themselves with the humanities and the arts, right? Max Weber wants sociology to sit in between that. He doesn't want to lose um, the project of explanation, but he wants to make it richer and more complex by uh, paying attention to this irreducibly meaningful character that human actions uh, involve. So how does he do that? Sorry, I forgot to click and, and do my fancy little circles on the slide, uh, but I, I, I intuitively picked out the key terms even without the clicks. So how does Weber in, achieve this balance between explanation and interpretation, right? Uh, and this is really the whole point. Once again, my silly face uh, is uh, interfering with a stick man in the diagram. Uh, that's all you're missing uh, uh, when looking at this diagram. It's a complex diagram, but not too complex, uh, I hope, right? So the key idea for Weber is that being meaningful, the fact that it's meaningful, does not make human phenomena less amenable to causal explanation. Remember that if you want to make explain something, you have to identify it in terms of its causes. What caused this to happen? Uh, if you can answer that question, you've made, uh, you provide an, an explanation for what you're trying to, to, to account for, right? Now for Weber, the reason that we can offer explanations of meaningful human action is because actions are indeed caused by people's motives. And those motives are meaningful. So understanding the motive that I have to give you this lecture, my motive to engage with you, to educate you, to be good at my job, to charm you, <laughs> that's part of my motive, that's why I'm always smiling in my clips. Uh, all of these motivations explain the action that I'm engaging in because they're causing it. Just like the motion of one billiard ball, if you like, causes upon impact the motion of another billiard ball or my hands impact with my other hand causes this, mo this motion to happen. So my motives cause my actions. So as a sociologist or indeed an anthropologist, if I can identify the causation between people's actions and the motives that cause them, I'm providing a sociological or anthropological or social, social scientific more broadly explanation, right? Now, because motives are meaningful, this act of explanation is causal but it is also interpretive. Sociologists, anthropologists, social scientists are in the business of interpreting the motives that cause particular actions in the social realm, right? So both explanation and interpretation are part of, of this um, uh, project, right? Now, I, talk, I, I exemplified this idea with my own individual 
uh, action now in giving you this lecture. But of course, the sociologists and the anthropologists are dealing with groups. They're dealing with historical periods. They're dealing with whole societies in some cases. They could not possibly uh, engage in trying to um, uh, kind of decipher or uncover the motivations of each individual in each particular action that they engage in. This would be absolutely impossible, right? So this is where uh, Weber's idea of the ideal type comes in. So sociologists, in interpreting the motives and thereby establishing the causes of human actions, must construct hypothetical ideal types of motives that appear reasonable given the situation that they're trying to explain. So let me give you a very kind of current example that um, might kind of resonate with you. If you remember uh, when due to COVID-19 and its outbreak, the government in this country and in many other countries had to implement social distancing and lockdown, as it was called, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, this drastic non-pharmaceutical intervention, as it was referred to, uh, radically trying to change people's behavior, making them stay at home, not interact with each other, keep distance and so on. The government um, engaged in a prolonged debate with behavioral scientists, who are social scientists really trying to, well, anyway, I won't say what they are, but anyway, social scientists, about the question of how long they thought people would be able to keep up with these very stringent rules. Would people get lockdown fatigue was a big question. Would it not be wise to delay as much as possible these very stringent restrictions on people's freedom of movement in order to maximize the effectiveness of the measures uh, in order uh, taking into account this idea that human beings will get tired at some point and will start breaking the rules right now this very generalized ascription of a motivation to people for breaking the rules or not breaking the rules is exactly what a Weberian approach would call an ideotypical or ideal type approach. This is a rational hypothesis about people's motivations and how they will pursue actions in line with those motivations. It is not a statistical or even an ethnographic engagement with all the individuals finding out what's going on in their minds, but it's a generalization that is reasonable under the circumstances to hypothesize as a motivation for these people. So that's what Weber thinks the job of the social scientist, the anthropologist, the sociologist is, is to arrive at these kind of hypothetical, ideal, ideotypical um, interpretations of people's motives uh, and thus uh, provide kind of reasonable explanations for why they do what they do. Now, a very important piece of uh, jargon that we associate with Weber is this idea of methodological individualism. Ultimately for Weber, and this is in contrast with Durkheim, uh, this, the social consists of a conglomerate of components, as he said uh, in the previous quote, who are individuals going about their lives according to their ideas, their motivations, their desires, and so on, right? So methodologically, as sociologists and anthropologists, whatever we, we say theoretically and analytically about the phenomena that we study must ultimately refer back to that level of individual motivations, individual actions, right? We shouldn't posit the social as some kind of sui generis level that needs to be theorized, as Durkheim would say, in its own uh, uh, account. Uh, nor should we abstract away from individual motivations when we talk about um, modes and means of production, if we're a Marxist and so on. Ultimately, what we have to say should refer back to human beings understood as individuals. And I've done this rather complex looking diagram there, where the, 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 the central hero of the diagram, the individual, is missing in the kind of top left hand corner of uh, where the camera is pointing <laughs> or is projecting. Uh, but you see there, uh, it's similar to the diagram in the, in the previous clip, that individuals have subjectively meaningful motives, which they translate into action. And those actions have effects. And those effects can change the meaning of objectively real meanings, values, norms, expectations, morality, and so on, which are there for Weber, these generalized, uh, objectively real conditions that we all 
uh, interact with, very much in agreement in this sense with Durkheim or Marx and so on. But because our individual action ha can have a reciprocal effect on these things, that's the difference for Weber, right? So we have agency, we can push back to these, these meanings and values and so on, which nevertheless do inform the meanings uh, of our own motivation. So there's this circular kind of process of thinking that the sociologists have to engage with when they interpret this um, uh, the actions of the people that they're trying to understand in terms of generalized, reasonably arrived at motivations that they can ascribe to those actions, which are these ideal types that are the meanings that the sociologist or the analyst uh, generates in the activity, in their own action as thinkers in trying to interpret um, the people uh, going about the particular activities that, the, that they're interested in, in pursuing. Okay, I hope this diagram makes some sense. You can study it and ask me questions uh, when you have the opportunity. Let me then give you an example of Weberian analysis. And the example I want to give you is what is probably Max Weber's most famous um, monograph study, which is the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism from 1905. Uh, in this slide, my face is covering a hundred dollar note which should give you a sense of the content of this book. It's about the emergence of capitalism and uh, particularly for Weber, um, the connection between capitalism and Protestantism and how those two things mutually support each other. And really the way that the book operates, and we'll see how this is an example of Weberian analysis in terms of motivations and their meanings, uh, as we saw in the previous slide, uh, it really re seeks to respond to the question of why capitalists emerged capitalism, the practice of capitalism, emerged most vigorously among Puritan Protestants. And he looks, for example, at um, the work of Calvinists in 18th century uh, USA as an example of this, right? So there is a connection for Weber between the emergence of capitalism and the emergence of Protestantism. And the way that he establishes this connection, as we'll see, is really in terms of the um, motivations uh, that people involved in those activities, capitalists and Protestants, uh, ascribed to what they did and the meaning that they attached to those motivations, right? So capitalism itself for Weber is not just an economic system as it is for Marx, as we saw in previous weeks. It is a form of motivation. It is, as the title of the book would have it, a kind of spirit. It has a spirit kind of ethos, a way of operating, a desire to operate in a particular way. And as an example of this kind of understanding of capitalism uh, as, a, as a set of motivations, a set of desires to act in particular ways, he gives Benjamin Franklin's moral advice in his speeches uh, in 18th century uh, America to tradesmen, to kind of early proto, if you like, capitalists, right? And one of the things that Franklin says in his advice to tradesmen, tradesmen is that being credit worthy, which is a kind of economic condition to be in, in a, particularly in a capitalist context, is not just a, a useful thing uh, in terms of allowing um, um, the ability, for example, for example, to attract investment, right? but also has a moral dimension. It's a matter of duty. It's a matter of honor as an as a, um, upstanding citizen of the, uh, of the time, right? So being credit worthy for Benjamin Franklin is uh, a kind of motivation for action um, that is aligned with moral and ethical responsibility and outlook, right? So more broadly, Weber explains, capitalism can be understood in terms of a kind of ideal type of behavior, right? What I was talking about in the previous slide, the idea um, that the sociologist can formulate certain generalized understandings of what is a reasonable uh, set of motivations that might underlie people's behavior in any particular context. Well, here is Weber, the sociologist, developing this ideal type of capitalist motivation, and he calls this a particular work ethic. This idea that you should be a zealous, anti-hedonistic, hardworking, get up early in the morning, devote yourself to your work, work really, really hard, 
Um, don't use the gain of your work uh, as a source of pleasure, but rather reinvest it into the work itself. So a fundamental thing that is at the origins of capitalism is the idea that profits made through the activity of work are reinvested into the business so as to accrue further um, uh, returns, right? And that's a kind of beginning of capitalism. Well, for Weber, this has a fundamentally ethical underpinning in this work ethic of, of the capitalist as the hardworking, early rising uh, kind of person, right? This ideal type that Weber formulates for capitalism, for him fits in an interesting way, it resonates, the technical term that he uses is, has an elective affinity with some of the ethical tenets of Protestantism, the Protestant Reformation, which happened, of course, in Europe in the 16th century and was still reverberating in the United States with the migration of these Puritan forms, including the Calvinists that he talks about and others to New England and other parts of the United States, right? So he finds a kind of fit a kind of continuity, a kind of resonance between this work ethic of capitalism and the tenets of Protestantism. And this is really the famous part of his argument. And it roughly runs something like this. There's two elements which, as, you'll, as we'll see, create a paradox in the kinds of motivations that now Protestants may be ascribed with in this ideotypical analysis that Weber is advancing. Right? So there's two elements. The first one is the element of the calling. So a very strong element in, in, in Protestantism, as opposed to Catholicism, is uh, the idea of the calling, which is the idea that all human action is action that should be directed towards amplifying the glory of God, right? Uh, human, pe human beings' duty is to do God's work. That is our calling as Protestants, if we are Protestants. Uh, I'm not, but, um, but some of you might be, I don't know. Um, so this fundamental idea of the calling that our actions are in the service of God. But crucially for Protestantism, and this is where things get interesting, we don't get brownie points for doing God's work under Protestantism. It's not that through doing God's work, we increase our chances of being saved, of being among the select few that God will welcome into paradise when the, the time of reckoning arrives. Uh, that's not how it works for Protestantism, because there's a strong doctrine or doctrine of predestination in, uh, in, in, in Protestantism, according to which God has already preordained who the select few, who the chosen ones are, who will be welcomed, welcomed into heaven, right? So who will be saved and who will not be saved is not, does not depend on, on people's actions in the world because it's already preordained by, by God. So you have this slightly contradictory um, uh, position, not contradictory, but a tension between the idea of the calling and the idea of predestination. And this for Weber leads to a very interesting paradox. Since Protestants are unable to influence their own destiny, but hope that their destiny is indeed to be one of the chosen ones who make it into heaven. The conclusion that they have to draw from this is that they, in their actions in this world, they have to behave as if they were one of the chosen ones. Their behavior in this world has to be consistent with being the kinds of people that God would preordain as uh, being worthy of salvation. And as per the premise of the calling, acting in this way as if as if you are already chosen to be one of the people who will be welcomed into heaven by God is to act in a way that glorifies God, to act in accordance to the calling, to display the signs, Weber says, of being one of the chosen ones, is to act according to um, the, the, the doctrine of Protestant calling, the idea that your action is in glory of God. So in this way, Protestantism and the ethic of, of, of Protestantism is in profound elective affinity with the spirit of capitalism, because the right-minded um, uh, Protestant um, has to behave in ways that are effectively ascetic in just the way that capitalism requires them uh, to do, right? So working hard, um, 
creating um, forms of behavior that glorify God, that do God's work, right, is a way for uh, Protestants to behave rather like monks might do, but not by abstracting themselves away from the world, but rather participating in the world and indeed in its economic structures uh, in the ways that the spirit of capitalism is uh, prescribing, right? So the kind of work ethic that Benjamin Franklin was talk talking about has its roots and is, has, is in elective affinity with a motivation that is profoundly Protestant, right? So Protestantism and capitalism uh, mutually support each other, are in elective affinity each other, uh, for, of, uh, of each other, and we can understand the emergence of capitalism uh, in relation to uh, these requirements of Protestantism, according to Weber. Now, it's important to notice here that this argument about this worldly asceticism and capitalist behavior being a form of that is an argument about people's motivations, right? Um, the way that Weber's argument is structured is essentially developing an ideal type of the kinds of motivations that capitalism involves and an ideal type of the kinds of motivations that Protestantism encourages and showing how these sets of motivations make sense in terms of each other, right? So people's actions are caused by these motivations and therefore this is an explanation that Weber is advancing for the emergence of capitalism. So there's a causal element here, but crucially, as my summary of his arguments would, would indicate, this involves Weber advancing the kind of ideotypical interpretation of the motivations that people um, can be ascribed with, uh, both in the forms of behavior of capitalism and the forms of behavior that make up Protestantism, and showing how these motivations are mutually reinforcing, right? So ultimately, um, these uh, uh, prescriptions for acting out of duty or fear of dam damnation, anxiety about whether you're among, among the, the saved ones by God, all of these things refer to people's innermost motivations or personal motivations for action, generalized through these ideal types that Weber is developing. And then these motivations are used to explain how they can have a causal um, um, effect and change effectively the development of history, in this case, the development of capitalism as a historical force. It's a very sophisticated kind of argument. I hope I've done it a little bit of justice in this clip. Uh, I really encourage you to read the book. It's a really, really interesting book to read. So I'll leave it there for this clip uh, and I'll see you in the, in the next clip uh, where we'll talk about power a little bit more uh, and more recent ideas of agency.